on today's story beat. Uh, one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with was Arvin Brown, who ran the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, Connecticut for many, many years. The, he took a lot of plays from Long Wharf Theater into, into New York, into Broadway and whatnot. He directed the View from the Bridge that I did on Broadway. He also directed the American Buffalo that I did on Broadway and then the tour. And Arvin was like, I called him a chemist because he knew exactly how to talk to everybody. He knew exactly what everybody needed to hear. And it wasn't just like sugarcoating. It was, he, he, he knew exactly what, in, you know, with American Buffalo, I, I was understudying and he knew exactly what I needed to hear. And he also knew exactly what Al Pacino needed to hear. Those weren't the same thing. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, the actor, director, teacher, and author John Shepard, began his professional career at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, where he was a company member for four seasons. Subsequently moving to New York, he worked in regional theaters like the Long Wharf, Yale Rep, Barter Theater, Actors Theater of Louisville, and many others. Off-Broadway, John performed at the Manhattan Theater Club, Soho Rep, the Public Theater, Lamb's Theater, and others. On Broadway, he worked in American Buffalo with Al Pacino, in which he also toured the U.S. and played on London's West End. And John also appeared in A View from the Bridge. Career highlights include the stage version of George Orwell's 1984, in which John played Winston Smith at the Wilma Theater, Kennedy Center, and Joyce Theater, and the world premiere of Eduardo Machado's Fabiola at the Theater for a New City. John spent time in L.A. pursuing TV and film work, appearing in many episodic TV series, including L.A. Law, Spencer for Hire, Dallas, Quantum Leap, and others. John's feature film credits include Sneakers and Patriot Games. After receiving an MFA in acting from Cal State University Long Beach, John became a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and finally at Point Park University, where he taught for over 20 years and was the theater department chair for 10 years. John's book, Auditioning and Acting for the Camera, is used throughout the country. Backstage Magazine named it one of 11 amazing books for the on-camera actor. John remains active in the Pittsburgh theater and film community, appearing in many plays for the Rep, City Theater, Quantum, Pict, and the Pittsburgh Public Theater. Highlights include playing Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman for the Rep, for which the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette named him Performer of the Year, and Ralph in A Christmas Story at the Pittsburgh Public Theater. John has also directed numerous productions, including August Osage County for Point Park's professional theater company, The Rep, and Tamara for Quantum, both were named Best Productions in their respective years by the Post-Gazette. While in Pittsburgh, he's appeared in TV shows like A League of Their Own and The Chair, and in films like The Race, Fathers and Daughters, Homemakers, The Deliverance, directed by Lee Daniels. For the record, John and I have known one another for many years, having met while both of us taught at Point Park. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a terrific joy for me to have my friend, the truly talented actor, director, teacher, and author, John Shepard, join me today. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Uh, what a nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to have someone with so much history behind them on the show. So let's go back in time a little bit. You've been at this acting game and a little bit of the writing game for a while. But at what age were you when the bug first bit you? How old were you when you thought, you know what, that thing people are doing up on stage and on, on screen, that's interesting to me. Well, that's, that's a great question. And, and I got bit by the bug when I was in high school, oddly enough. I went to a Catholic high school in Southern California. And I had a, we had a teacher, uh, God knows why he was working there, but he had been a, a one of the founding original company members of a, the South Coast Rep in mm -hmm. Orange County, a very reputable um, major, you know, theater. And and uh, the first play he directed at this Catholic high school 
was uh, The Visit by Friedrich Durenmont. I don't know if you're familiar with that play. I am, I am. But it's very risque, especially for like a Catholic school. Anyway, I auditioned for it because what the heck, and I found out later through him, his name was Paul Ford, not the famous Paul Ford actor, but uh, you know, another actor. He I, he told me later that 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 I really I was awful in the audition, and that the <laughs> only reason he cast me was that I was a guy, you know. And uh, but I sort of got bit by the bug during that production, and um, I actually went to college, you know, thinking I was going to be a, like a sociology major. But you know, uh, they were doing as you like it, and they had auditions coming up and and so i auditioned and i got cast and there you go I and just, once that uh, bug is in your vein it's really hard to get back out isn't it yeah i you know and i and i used to tell my students this i i think it has to do with theater you sort of form a family and the great thing about that family is that it, it ends i mean it's like you know for a short while you're in this part of this new family and everyone gets really close and you're doing this project and you're all thrilled about this project and then it sort of goes away and you move on to the next family. And it's sort of like, oh, that's really cool. You, and you'll stay friends with many of these people for the rest of your life. But it's uh, it's kind of a it's it's kind of addictive. It's totally addictive. And if you like the entertainment part of the entertainment industry, then it's really addictive because it's fun is what it winds yes, up being. It, it, it's, it is fun. People don't realize how much hard work it is to do, but right. it's fun work if you're approaching it right, I think. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's a reason they call it a play, you know? So so did you get a degree at UC Irvine in acting? Yeah, I got a BA in acting at the University of California, Irvine. I'd gone to, I, I originally went to Cal State uh, at the time, it was, it was uh, Fresno State College. Uh, and um, it was a good program. I did a lot of uh, work there, but I was, I felt that I was on a treadmill and, and I wasn't really learning the kind of things I should be learning. And, uh, and I, you know, I had to take, I was putting myself through school at the time. And in those days, you know, you could, but I, I uh, took off six months to make some money and then went to uh, transfer to UC Irvine where I got my degree. And so what do you think you learned in your days at UC Irvine when you were getting your degree that you kept with you? What did you learn that held you in good stead for most of your career? A lot of the, you know, a lot of the fundamentals about, you know, the actor's process. I mean, I'll be honest, I, there are things that I wish that I had learned uh, or things that I heard about other people learning in other programs that I wish that had been incorporated in my in my program. But but I had some excellent teachers and I, uh, you know, the basic fundamentals, the, the foundation, if you will. And I think that uh, that those those fundamentals have served me throughout my life. So one of the things that I find over the years of actually having training in a school and then going off and having a career and so on, one of the things that I find is true is that schools don't really teach you much about the business of being in show business. They teach right. you about the art part of it. Right. And I assume that was true for you too. Y yes, but also um, there was, a, there was a, a, a faculty member there at the time, Robert Cohen, who was probably the first guy, he wrote a book he wrote a number of books, uh, acting one. Um, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but he wrote, he was maybe the first one to write a book called Acting Professionally. And he, he it was all about the business. Now, ironically, Professor Cohen had never really been an actor or been in the business. So, you know, once I realized that it was sort of like, oh, okay, but at least he tried. And, and for a while, it was the only book out there that even dealt with things like headshots and agents and and things like that so i felt that that i did have a bit of a heads up in that in that way how interesting that someone that was not actually active in the business was writing about the business well he he was a great writer and he loved to write and uh and he he sort of had his pulse on his finger on the pulse of what was needed out there in programs and and that was certainly one of them like he said there are very very few places where you got that kind of training about what to expect in the real world. So how long was it after you left school and went out into the real world? How long was it before you thought to yourself, or maybe it was while you were in school, you tell me, I really am pretty good as an actor. I'm good at this. I can actually make a go at it. Yeah, I, I well, okay, I graduated and, uh, and, and did some summer stock. And then, you know, I was uh, in Southern California. So I started in the um, LA, you know, the LA film and TV area, arena. And um, I, I really didn't know and that's a great question, Steve. I really didn't know if I could compete at that level. I didn't know if I was good enough. 
and I had an agent and she was sending me, I mean, in those days, it was sort of like I'd be on the phone talking to someone and, and she would break in, you know, an emergency. I mean, there was no call waiting. Was no, she would break in and I'd be like, oh my, panic, like something happened and, and it would be just to send me on an audition. So her name was <laughs> Gloria Green. And um, it'd been sort of a dream of mine to to work at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So I went up there personally and, and auditioned for Jerry Turner, then the, the artistic director. And then uh, uh, I got offered a job there and uh, she, you know, she was like, my agent was like, are you crazy that you're taking yourself out? You know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I, I just really felt that I needed verification that this is something I could do professionally. So I, and I had no qualms about leaving um, and going up there and, and working. And uh, also when I was in LA at the time, you know, I was reading backstage magazine or I was reading the Hollywood reporter and, and and they all seemed to be talking about New York actors, and they all wanted New York actors. And I thought, wow, I should I should really be a New York actor. So, so my my goal sort of was after the the Oregon Shakespeare Festival that I would go to New York, which is, which is exactly what I did. Well, so you got a pretty good amount of training, professional training, being at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Yeah. Oh yeah. You did a lot of shows, I assume. I did over sixteen shows in four years, four seasons, and. Uh, and yeah, and that's to, to answer your question, that's where I sort of be, realized that I could do this professionally. You knew from doing that that you actually could handle it. Yes. Yeah. And then you went to New York, I presume, more about being in theater than thinking about film or TV, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, what yeah. is it that makes theater special for you? Because clearly you've been in theater most of your career, <laughs> though you've done some camera work, and we'll talk about that too. But what is it about theater that's special for you? I just think... Um, I like the ephemeral quality of theater. I, I, I think it's, I mean, you know, it's been said that theater is, is an actor's medium. Um, and, uh, you know, film and TV is, you know, either a writer's medium or a director's medium or an editor's medium. You know, I, I maybe the, the, the idea of the control that the actor sort of has when they're on stage and, you know, it's sort of like it's your ball game that appealed to me, but also I think just the, the, the telling a story, you know, with a group of people that you loved and, you know, feeling the audience. I think the audience is so important. Uh, There's such an important element of the theater that you're getting the reactions immediately. And that this is the only time that this, this performance will ever take place. And so for all those reasons and all the, and to put it very simply, all the people that I admired and respected and looked up to all the actors that that I loved were all theater trained actors. Like who? Who did you look up to? Like Marlon Brando and and you know people like that. I mean, they ultimately became you know famous in in film and stuff, but they they had sort of a, a grounded experience with theater and yeah. So all the people that I really respected, you know, I mean, it was sort of the you know when I was in school, it was The Godfather was coming out and things like that. So all those all those guys, and I ultimately got to work with Al Pacino, but. You know, I, I'll, everybody I respected had come from the theater. So you prefer to work in the theater than on film, though you won't turn a job down, I assume. Yeah, I, looking back, I probably realized I, I realized that I probably should have preferred working in film and TV. <laughs> well, if you want to be rich, I guess that's where to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's where you, you know, I, when I wrote my book about acting for the camera, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I tell my students, look, if you want to if you want a career, you're going to have to learn how to work in front of a camera. Um, because that's what pays. Um, theater really doesn't pay. So yeah, but but yeah, I, I do love I do love the theater. What would you say are the basic major differences between acting on stage and acting for a camera? It's scale. It's all it's all scale. And a, and a demonstration I would do for my students is, is is quite simply, I would stand six feet away from a student and say, okay, so this is this is the theater. You know, you're you're looking. You can see my entire body, and and there's enough distance between us, where you know, you, and you can also. I mean, the challenge of the theater is that the audience can look anywhere they want. So if you're not riveting enough, if you're not you know charismatic enough, they'll they'll start looking at the scenery or whatever. And then I would then I would go up to like six inches away from the, the my student's face and say, okay, this is this is working on camera. So it's a matter of you you know you can get away with a lot more on stage. Uh, than you can in front of a camera. Uh, so I think it all boils down to scale, uh, simplistic. simplistic and and in, I assume the same thing goes scale-wise for the way that you actually present, because on camera, you, you're you not going to be trying to get to the, the upper reaches of oh, the right. balcony. 
That's what I mean. Right. Exactly. It's all yeah. much more internal or, or not Absolutely. internal, but brought down. Absolutely. And it's sort of the camera sort of can read your mind in a weird way. I mean, you know, they, the wheels have to be turning. I've worked with that. I've worked with theater actors who go in front of a camera and think that you can't do anything. And so subsequently nothing is coming out. And, <laughs> and that's not really the case. You have to be active, but it, it, it can't be in a large sort of, you know, uh, capacity. So it has to be very small. Because the, the, the old phrases are, there are various phrases, you know, it's like an x-ray machine. It sees through you. Exactly. And, and so, and that's the camera really does reveal sort of all of what you're thinking at that exactly. moment. It, it, or, or if nothing, yes. <laughs> but yes, you're absolutely right. So what for you, when you're thinking about uh, plays that you'd want to be in, and whether you've been in them or not, what for you makes a good role to play good to play? What attracts you to roles? That's a great question. I, I think that there's got to be a connection to you. The things that the roles that, that resonate most with me are where I can find myself in the role easily. Not, and not, it's not sort of a shortcut. It's, it's, it's like, can I relate? Is there empathy? Um, do I understand this character, even though I've never been in that situation? Uh, do I like this person? Or sometimes more interestingly, if I don't like this person, what about that it compels me to want to play that part? Um, not that all the characters have to be likable because they're not. So I think it's just a matter of how do I relate? Can I find a point of relatability to the character and of course, the sense of challenge, I think, fuels a lot of actors and a lot of their choices in terms of what what they do in terms of is this is this going to force me to go someplace that I haven't been before? Um, what is this? What is this asking of me? And, uh, you know, you, you, whether or not you admit it, you invest an enormous amount in playing a character. And sometimes um, I, I've looked back and like, for instance, you know, when I did Willie Loman, I realized it wasn't until almost after I finished the run that I realized that, you know, you're dealing, you're playing a guy who's in the last 24 hours of his life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's kind of a heavy burden. And uh, so, you, you know, I would wonder why I'm, why is this driving me crazy? And you, then you realize, um, so there was something about that character, of course, for me, the whole, the whole thing about my father was a salesman and that whole connection with my father compelled me to sort of want to do that. I assume over time, especially in a rep company and so on, you've played parts where you were assigned to play the part and you might not have been feeling as related to that character. How do you overcome that as an actor? What do you do? Yeah, you find a way to relate. I mean, yeah, that's that's happened a lot. You're, you're given a character, you're, you're asked to play a role that you, you cannot relate to. Uh, and then you sort of go, okay, well, then you find a way to sort of, it's, it's almost as if you have to find a way to love the character that you're playing. Even though, even if, the, if it's the worst person on earth, you have to find a way to love that person or love the character. And maybe that's a, a relatability issue. I'm not exactly sure, but I think if you can't relate immediately, you find a way to sort of relate on some level. And if you don't love that character, it'll show, won't it? Oh Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, playwrights don't write mundane stories. They don't, they don't write, you know, boring, awful, mundane stories. Well, no one wants to see well if they do, they don't get produced. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So you've got to find a way to sort of like embrace the character and love the character um, no matter what. Yeah, that can be a real challenge. You know, from the moment that you've booked a role, someone has cast you. Obviously, the first thing you will do is read the script. I mean, that's the, clearly the first thing you'll do. But after that, what do you do to begin to develop a character? How do you develop something that you're going to play? Well, I think about it. I just think about it a lot. And I don't, I don't venture too far from the script. I like to really read the play over and over and over and over and start um, really unearthing the, the, the play. And it's sort of like... Uh, once uh, someone once told me, you you know, to, to in order to sort of really start to determine whether or not you even want to play the, the character, you read the play, uh, just understand what it's about. You read the play second time to to sort of hone in on what's going on, and then the fifth time you read it, you're you're, you're almost ready to decide if you want to do it or not. So I just think that the more you read the play, the the more you unearth what's going on in the play, the more you sort of analyze what's going on, um, and thinking about it, and thinking about what I would do in these situations, how I would react in these situations. 
And that's the that's part of the relatability issue uh, is, you know, putting yourself in that in that position. What then is the most challenging aspect of doing that? What is it finding that relatability that that's in there? What challenges you the most when you're trying to figure it out? Well, sometimes it's it's hard to sort of put yourself in the situation. Uh, certainly, uh, just technical things can be challenging in terms of like line loads, uh, the the accessibility of the lines, how difficult the lines are as written, um, things like that. Your relationship with the director is key and certainly really, really important. And I've worked with some amazing directors and brilliant directors. And I've also worked with directors that I'm like, eh, not so crazy about. So I mean, it, there's all kinds of things that sort of like force you to sort of think about how it's going and where it's going and things like that. You've worked with great directors and some mediocre directors and so on. What would you say are the most important lessons you've taken away from working with the great directors? What are a couple, one or two great lessons they taught you? Well, can I name names? If you wish, sure. Uh, one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with was Arvin Brown, who ran the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, Connecticut for many, many years the, he took a lot of plays from Long Wharf Theater into, into New York, into Broadway and whatnot. He directed The View from the Bridge that I did on Broadway. He also directed The American Buffalo that I did on Broadway and then the tour. And Arvin was like, I called him a chemist because he knew exactly how to talk to everybody. He knew exactly what everybody needed to hear. And it wasn't just like sugarcoating. It was, he 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 knew exactly what, in, you know, with American Buffalo... I was understudying and he knew exactly what I needed to hear. And he also knew exactly what Al Pacino needed to hear. Those weren't the same thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I saw him do this and I, I, I coined the phrase, he's a chemist. He knew exactly how much to do here, how much to do there. And to me, it was all about communication. And so that's what I think made him a, a brilliant director. And it's, a bit of a psychologist. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you been able to apply the lessons you learned over the years from these I've great tried. Directors? I've tried, Steve. Oh, I've tried. Yeah. I, I Yeah, but sometimes it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you're your own person and you have your own way of coming at right. things. Right. You're, you're not Arvin Brown and you shouldn't be Arvin right. Brown. He's Arvin right. Brown. You know, I mean, he ended up uh, going out to L.A. and directing TV and stuff. And But he, yeah, he was he was brilliant. It's important that sometimes when you take a part that you are going to work against what might people might expect as the choices or the expectations. And I assume that that helps to make up, to fill a part out or to expand its understanding in the general scope of the public, which may be familiar with a famous part or a Shakespearean play. How important is it to find a way to work against expectations? That's a great question. And I think um, I think it, it, it boils down to your take, uh, trusting yourself to know that your take on, on a particular character is legitimate, that you may not, you know, you don't certainly look like the, the person who made the part famous, or you don't, you're not that person, you don't act like that person, um, but you have your own legitimate take on this character because of who you are. And I think the more you can sort of listen to yourself and not try to emulate somebody else or be someone else is the key to that. It's a development of the three-dimensionality of that character to make it a real believable human, whether right. or not it's like what people are expecting or not. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's like a good example would be when, you know, like speaking of Death of a Salesman, when, when Dustin Hoffman played Death of a Salesman, he brought a whole different you know, take on that character that anybody had even thought of. Um, and it was legitimate. So it's it's a great example of him bringing out Dustin Hoffman in that part uh, to play that part, just as I brought out John Shepard to play Willie Loman when I played that part. So that was first, I think, on Broadway was Lee J. Cobb, wasn't it? Lee J. Cobb, exactly. And so Lee J. Cobb and Dustin Hoffman could not be more disparate in who they oh. are. Totally opposite. Right. Right. <laughs> right. That is for sure. So, all right, that's a good question then. If you're playing something that's an established character that the public knows versus creating a character for the first time in a play that nobody's ever seen before, what are those differences in how you would approach that part? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to think you know, altruistically, I'd like to think, think that there's no difference <laughs> but <laughs> there, the, the challenge of playing a part like Willie Loman or something that's really well known or famous 
is that you know that you're being compared. You're always going to be compared to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is challenging. And um, I think you try to sort of block those voices, you know, that say you're not so-and-so or, you know, you're not, you know, not as good as so-and-so or, or whatever. Um, so that does add to the, the level of challenge. Whereas when you're creating a role, it's, it's nice to uh, it's, it's, you, you, you're given a little bit of liberty to sort of like really put your own stamp on it for whatever that's worth. But I don't think actors, at least I don't go around thinking about things like that. I try not to think about things like that. Like this is my, I'm putting my stamp on it. I mean, you're just, you're going about thinking, what can I bring to this part that is unique? And I think what ultimately you bring to the part is, is a part of yourself because we're all unique. And if we just stay true to that, you're going to be okay. Well, ultimately, you're going to try to do the best that you can in either case. Doesn't matter what the case right. is. In one situation, people are coming into the theater saying, well, how's this actor going to pull off this particular character right. versus they don't know what to expect. So you're giving them that, that basis on which they're going to judge the rest of the time that they ever see it. Right, right. So you've appeared in both dramas and comedies, and you've done a bunch of both. Do you prefer doing one over the other? I like comedy. I, I really like comedy. I love the sort of um, instant gratification that you get when when the audience finds it funny uh, uh, or not, which is which is also, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenging. But I like them both. I mean, I, you know, it's not like I have a preference. I think that whatever an actor sort of like, well, th what's your favorite part? The one I'm working on. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like if I'm doing a real tragic thing, that's going to be my favorite thing right now. And, but looking back, I, I think comedy is gratifying. I've had most of the actors that have been on this show when I've asked a question like that to them, most of them prefer comedy. I just simply think it's because it's more fun to play. It is, but it is, it is kind of more challenging too, because again, there's that instant sort of like you you either know it's working or you know it's not working. <laughs> well, what's the old adage? You know, uh, dying is easy, comedy is hard. That's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Do you work when you're cast in a role today as hard at breaking a script down as you did when you were starting out? Boy, that's a great question. You know, no, I think so many things. It's sort of like a pianist. You know, there's techniques. You you know, scales and and the techniques. You know, all those fundamental things that you learn, and by the time you're a master, I'm not saying I'm a master, but at the time you've done it, you know, for dozens of years, and you know, you you don't need to do as many of the scales and and whatnot. I have a neighbor who's a who's a professional tuba player, and you know, so he says to me sometimes, he's like, I don't need to practice, I I got it, you know, and it's like, ah, that's a that's a great attitude. So I, I I used to to sort of specifically answer that question when I first started out. I would write everything in my script. I mean, I wrote every, my scripts were like just full of my notes and and writing and 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 analysis and beats and 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 objectives and everything i would just write down everything and now i don't write down anything um and it's sort of sort of like part of my subconscious you are already seeing it as you're reading it you already know what those yeah. things are and, yeah. and don't don't sell yourself short john you are a master you've been doing it for a really long time <laughs> And, and when you have, and you've taught it for a long time too, which of That's course true. also helps to contribute to your mastery of the subject is you're constantly seeing others doing it and either helping them to get better at it or correcting them on things that they're right. not doing properly, right. et cetera. So you become a master that way too. I want to talk about your book for a moment, which I think is a terrific book uh, in auditioning and acting for the camera. Talk about how important it is for actors to listen. Well, it's uh, it's really important. It's it, because a lot of times actors, the, the the mentality, the old joke is, you you talk blah 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 blah, then it's my line, you know, you, you, blah 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 blah, then it's my line, and it's sort of like the actors really don't really pay attention until unless they're talking, um, unless they're the center of attention, and so often, especially in, on camera, um, they'll cut to you reacting as often as they cut to you talking so listening is is as active has to be as active as speaking and but not overly listening i mean you can't indicate that you're listening you can't like oh i'm listening now um it just has to be natural and but you really have to do it it sounds sort of quaint but you know you have to listen and even though you know what the response is even though you know what they're going to say you still have to listen 
um, because sometimes they don't. Because it has to be as if you're hearing it for the first time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and there is a difference between hearing and listening, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. I I came up with this in my book. I talk about there's a five-step reaction. And um, the first step is hearing um, because it's sort of like it is different. The second step is listening. The third step is forming an opinion. The fourth step is wanting to speak. And the fifth step of of this five-step reaction is actually speaking. So if you're already involved in a conversation, you kind of, you don't need the first one, the hearing, but yeah, there's a, there's a definite difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is kind of like Pavlovian. Listening is active. Hearing is autonomic. It's that you can't help if you have the sense of hearing in your body, if you're not, if you're not deaf, then you are hearing what is going on all the time, whether you're picking it up and, and processing it or not. But listening requires an activity. Yep. And and in, in this five little five step reaction that I came up with, you can't form to me, the third one forming an opinion is the most important one, because we all do that in a conversation or when we're dealing with someone, when we're listening. You can't form a re, you can't form an opinion unless you're listening. So it's like, you know, one thing leads to another. Why is it necessary for actors to be able to relax both on stage and maybe more importantly in front of a camera? Why is that important? Well, because Stanislavski, the great teacher, the Russian teacher who he he had a system and the method is a spinoff of that system, but he is considered sort of the father of modern acting. He used to say that no inspiration can happen, no no art can happen unless you are in a state of relaxation. So that to him, it was the first sort of step. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that because tension tends to sort of choke you up. It tends to cut you off. It tends to put a barrier between you and and what you want to do. You know, it's a barrier between you and the audience. It's just, you know, it's it's, it's not good. Uh, it also just is not good um, physically. It tightens up your jaw. It, you know, it, it shut, cut, shuts down your breathing. So I think that that, a sense of relaxation is important so that it, so of sort of uh, the creative process can sort of happen. I'm assuming it has to be that if you are tense or uptight or whatever that is, it does constrict everything. Yes, right. And you need to be kind of loose and free and that requires relaxation. Right. Why is it important then for actors to be able to improvise? Is that relaxation part of that? Well, I think that... Um, one of the things that actors possess large quantities of, and and one thing that I I always felt that I that I had in spades was a, a imagination, a sense of imagination, um, and I I also you know it also sort of goes hand in hand with relaxation, you know, for relaxation a, a, a sense of imagination, and I think that improv just sort of lets that imagination loose. Um, so I think that uh, that it does sort of go hand in hand and a lot of times uh, improvisation will uh, a lot of tension will will result from being focused on yourself and uh when the more you're focused on yourself the more in inward you're looking the 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 more tension can can come out come out of that when you're when you're focused on the other person Mm -hmm. when you're focused on on an improv type of situation you're sort of sending the focus away from yourself and into the into the world, into the the atmosphere, if you will, and um, and I think that's one of the the nice uh, outcomes of 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 improvisation. It's sort of related to the same thing we talked about earlier, which is that if you're improvising, you are, or even if you're improvising when you're actually doing written lines, or if it feels like improvisation, it will feel like it's happening for real for the first time. That sense of spontaneity, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's really important because otherwise it seems canned all the time. Exactly. Yeah. So, what are the pluses and minuses of actors thinking about doing commercials? Well, Steve, that, you know, when I when I graduated school, first of all, the, ironically, and I used to tell my students this, so I'm not like you know, revealing anything. When I was graduating, everyone was sort of like, "What are you going to do? Are you going to go to grad school? Are you going to go to grad school?" And my response was literally, are you kidding? I don't want to teach. I'm not going to teach. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and me both. I didn't, I never thought I'd teach. Yeah. So I, I go back to get my MFA in my forties. So, you know, there you go. That's sort of the way I looked at it. And I also th- sort of thought poo pooed, you know, commercial workers. So like who wants to do commercials and my age, like the, I talked about my age in Los Angeles, that's pretty much 
all she did was was commercials. But now I realize I have a very good friend who made a fortune, made a fortune doing commercials. And uh, and I write about it in my book that you know you you could you could learn to do commercials and 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 try to get good at it and book commercials uh, that that could potentially pay you a lot of money or you could go out and wait tables and and the things that I ended up doing you know what I mean so, <laughs> so uh, I think that's a good uh, you know a good uh, a good justification for why you might want to it's do commercials. It's still acting, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is, of course. But you know, when I was trained. It was sort of like frowned upon like all that commercial stuff was frowned upon. like it's beneath you or something yes exactly i'm better than that well so i did a lot of i ended up doing a lot of soap operas back in the day and and uh they were great the, the, the talk about the camaraderie and the and the people on soaps were just the most amazing generous wonderful pe people in the world and talk about difficult that stuff is really hard to do because you're memorizing a huge amount of stuff for oh, and they change it every minute, and and talk about you know the you know the the the, the question of would you rather do you know serious stuff or comedy? They're always it's always serious, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's 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 kind of funny. So they're 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 a cool bunch of people. Well, I've had the great privilege on this show of uh, of interviewing two stars of The Young and the Restless, both Melody Thomas Scott and Kate Linder, and. You know, they talk about they memorize many, many pages in the course of yep. every day. And you think, yep. how does that work? Well, so that leads me to ask you, what is your technique for memorization? How do you memorize large chunks of things? I, maybe I'm just slow. I don't, but I, there's, no, there's no quick way around it for me. I, it's like rote. It's like sit down. And, and I'm really, I've become really good at knowing exactly how long it's going to take me to learn a part. Hmm. And I can sit down with a play. You know what's what, and this is different than than film and TV because you never have to learn huge chunks and right, TV. right, right. Just learn what the scene you're doing, or you learn the you know, and you've got plenty of time between stuff to 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 brush up. But in plays, you know, you do the whole thing every day. So I I can sit down with a play and literally figure out how long it's going to take me to to learn it because I start out and I learn a page or two. And the next day I go back and review those page, those two pages and move on to the next page or two. And that's literally how I do it. So it's, it's pure labor. Pure labor, pure labor. And so for instance, when you played older Ralph in Christmas Story, <laughs> how long did it take you? Because that was, by the way, that was phenomenal to see it. I, if anybody's ever in Pittsburgh and they're doing Christmas Story again and John's in it, it's well worth your time. But well, how long did it take you? Again. They are doing it again. Are, they, are you in yeah. it again this fall? This yeah, uh, I'm, fall? I'm, I'm accepted. We had some, you know, negotiation, but it, it all worked out. Well, that was a tough one because I'd like to, you know, think that I would. I read the play before I agree to audition for it, and I certainly like to know the play before I accept it. I hadn't seen the movie. Like I'm one of the only people in the, in the world who hadn't seen the movie, <laughs> and they asked me to audition for it, and I was, you know, I jumped at the chance, and I, and I auditioned, and. And they and I asked for a script and they didn't send me one and that's okay. Uh, I auditioned and then they offered it to me and I accepted and then I I'm like I really would like a script. Then I saw the movie and I thought, uh oh, you know, because <laughs> in the movie the character that I play in the play the the play is a direct takeoff of the film, and and Gene Shepard who wrote the 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 short stories the movie is based on does the voiceover narration of the film as you know, and. Now the play, he's a character. <laughs> so these lines have to be learned. And I was like freaked out. And um, and when I finally got the play, I sat down and started learning them. And I thought, oh, I can't, I can't. I had a month to answer your question. I had one month. Wow. Wow. And I, I a friend of mine, a re an actor that I absolutely respect and admire, Bill Nye. I, I absolutely ad adore Bill Nye's work. And someone told me, a friend of mine told me that the way Bill Nye he learns lines is he locks himself in his basement every day and just goes at it. He, it's work. It's like a job. And that's how I learned that role in a month. I would I, go down to my basement, shut the door, and I would just go. The actor's fear, knowing that people are going to be seeing this, well, has something to do with it. But yeah, it was it was a tough one because it took me it took me like three or four months to learn Willie Loman. It took me, you know, six months to learn um the master builder. Uh what's his I forget his name, but the the, the major the, the the lead in Master Builder, Ibsen's play. What you're um, what you're not telling people what they because you are sort of the narrator of the show in the case of that play, 
you're not really interacting with anybody. It's you doing exactly. monologues. That's the other hard part is monologues are always harder to learn than than dialogue. Uh, and there were moments in, in the production of A Christmas Story where my character steps away from being the narrator and becomes a, a another uh, character, like the trees, the, the Christmas tree salesman or um, or the cowboy, you know, and, and, and that is so much easier to learn. It's so much more fun to do. Yeah, it's kind of like the 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 old Ralph in, in the Christmas story is kind of like the, the stage manager in, in you know in uh, in our town. Right. Well, it is much easier when you have someone to bounce off of. Right. And if you go if you happen to go up on the line, it gets a whole, whole lot more challenging because nobody's there to help bail you out. Right. <laughs> right. The, 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 my partner in in, in do, you know doing the, the narration is the audience. You know, they're not always as giving as another actor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. What is your philosophy toward auditioning? How do you teach people to audition? A director friend of mine, I asked him that question because I was like trying to figure out how to teach that, how to how to go about teaching that. And his response was something that never left me. And I think it's something that, that actors have to consider. This director friend of mine told me about a, an actor he knew, and he just conducted himself every day as an actor. I am an actor. And and the days that he was working were the fortunate days where he was working as an actor. But as actors, you're not working most of the days. You're not working even the majority of the days. But he said, I would conduct myself as an actor every single day and look at my life through those lens. And, and so when I had an audition, I prepared for the audition like I would a, a role. And and that's part of the job. You know, your part, part of the job is to get your headshots. Part of the job is to get an agent. A part of the job is to, and you know, hopefully you're getting auditions. Part of the job certainly is to prepare for those auditions. So if I'm an actor, I conduct myself as an actor, even on the most of the days when I'm not working as an actor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really fantastic attitude toward it. And I've heard any number of actors say that when they go on an audition, they consider it to be, it's just another day of acting, period. Exactly. Exactly. It's not you got you're not trying to get the role. You're not trying to do this. You're just acting. Period. Right. I, th right. I think that's a really phenomenal way to look at it. When you're in a show or when you're directing a show, there's going to be a give and take of notes between the director and the actor. Whether you're the actor or whether you're the director, what is your attitude and philosophy toward note giving and note taking? Well, as a director, I love to give notes to the chagrin of most of the actors that work with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and, and it's not it, it's not like a, 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 it's not a control thing it's not it's it's like i'm always like trying to experiment with a different way of doing something so my notes are, are merely like why don't you try why don't you try this and the worst thing that i i the, the thing i can't stand as a director is when someone says well you told me yesterday to do that well yeah but that was yesterday and now i'm thinking of something else so hopefully that's my and that's my attitude as an actor um is that i look forward to notes i want notes i i I love the director's perspective. I, that's why that's why we have this relationship. I love getting their feedback. I love their ideas, and uh, it's a play. It, you know, I my favorite time doing a play is rehearsal. It's like that's the time to to fall down, make mistakes, uh, experiment. So I I look at notes from both the director and the actor's viewpoint as as a time of you know experimentation. So when you're in rehearsal, do you, as an actor, are you anticipating that someone is going to give you feedback? Have you ever been in a situation where an, a director gave you little or no feedback? Oh, yeah. Oh, I hate that. Oh, absolutely. I, I hate that because you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know what kind of effect you're having on them. And not that I want a director to tell me what to do. I think I think I have very good instincts. And I generally find that the director is like... Um, the best notes are like, try this. Uh, and I, I hadn't thought of it, you, you know, um, that's what I'm looking for, you know? And then sometimes it's a matter of, well, I think I'm doing this when they're, and the director's like, well, this is what I'm seeing. Mm. And, and that's not exactly what I thought I was doing. So that's very helpful. Is that then confusing? No, it's because, oh, then I'm, then I have to change the, the way I'm doing it. I have to come at it from a different perspective. So uh, what happens if you're directing an actor who disagrees with you, the director? Well, I just ask them to try it. I just ask them to let their uh, uh, prejudices go for a second or or their whatever their thought process and, and try something. 
and sometimes it's liberating and they they discover something brand new that that's absolutely precious or sometimes it doesn't work at all and i ha as a director i have to be the first one to say you know what that idea i had was terrible what you're doing what you were doing is is better and hopefully i'm working with directors who will say that to me too but it's a collaborative thing and uh, i think it's important that you're that you have that kind of give and take to sort of address what i thought you brought up in terms of your colleagues one thing i can't stand is when other actors are giving you notes mm, well for sure it's really not their place to give you notes, is it? No, absolutely right. right. Yeah, no, it's, it's it, they can go have a conversation with the director and then it's the director's job to try and work that out. Right. Assuming absolutely. the director agrees with the, the thoughts of that actor. Talent cannot really be taught, can it? It's only, it can only be refined. Exactly. And acting is so subjective. You and I can watch a performance and we both have opposite feelings about it. I can love it, you hate it, or, or you love it, I, I don't like it. So talent is very subjective. And I used to, my, my whole approach to teaching was what's not subjective is your work product, is your work ethic. You know, are you there? Are you on time? Are you ready to work? Have you done your work? Have you, have you done your homework? Um, have you, you put in the time it takes to do what, what is asked of you? And, uh, and are you willing to work and, and willing to, to fail? That's super important. And those are not subjective. Those are objective. I think so. In terms of if an actor like disagrees with a note I give, for example, then it says to me that they're not willing to fail. They're not willing to try something that may not work for the sake of trying something, which, you know, if we don't, if we don't fail, we're never going to succeed. For sure. So, so you know, I think uh, the idea of, of uh, that is not subjective. Is that usually fear? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's always and, fear. And how do we overcome fear for the theater? Just by being brave, I guess? I th I think so. Yeah, I I as an actor, you have to sort of realize that you're you're going to be okay no matter what happens. That it's up it's you up there, and if they don't like you, it's it's not your fault. Um, but it is something I will say that I've always envied. I've always envied artists like painters or sculptors, or even musicians who you know if someone doesn't like their work, it's separate from the person. Do, do you know what I mean? It's like I, I do. didn't like the way you played that piece. I didn't like the way I don't like that painting. Um, and you're not necessarily standing there when they make those opinions. As an actor, we are it. It's like <laughs> there's, no, there's no hiding behind our art. Uh, you you know, it's it's part of you. So that's what makes it so difficult. Well, as a writer, it really it reflects you, perhaps, but it isn't you. Right. And the actor, it is your your physical being. Exactly, exactly. And 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 when you write something and someone reads it, you're not you're not sitting there while they're reading it. <laughs> you know, as an actor, you're well at least on stage, you're like you know you're present. That's when you say but in comedy, either they laugh or they don't. Well, you know? that's that is for sure the actual marker of comedy. If they're not laughing, it's not a comedy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So the chemistry of a group of actors in a play or on a movie, that chemistry is super important to an outcome most of the time. I, sometimes in a movie, it doesn't matter. But on stage, that chemistry is important. How important is the chemistry in a classroom? Oh, it's it's really important. It's like it's like a microcosm of of a set of, of being in a, in a film on a film set or on, on a, you know, on a stage set. It's yeah, it's like you form a, a bond. A class forms a bond. And uh, every member of the of the class is important, and and everything that they bring to the process is important, which is true in in theater and film. So yeah, it's 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 I think it's a microcosm of that. One of the things that made me retire from teaching was the the pandemic, and when Point Park decided that they were going to come back to a um, you know hybrid model with you know uh, some people not in the classroom and some people in the classroom, but more importantly everyone wearing masks and staying socially distant, I thought there's no way you can teach an acting class under those conditions, you know. It would be class. very hard, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's impossible. So, I, you know, I, my joke was that I'd been waiting for a sign and I almost missed the giant neon sign that said coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we all know that actors, writers, directors, people in the business of putting on shows do not need to go to school in order to perform, right. to be, be in that art. Right. How important to you, or what do you think about education? What do you think that should students go and get an education? Why is it worth it? Well, I, you know, Steve, that's a great question. I, 
I've been rethinking that question since pandemic. I mean, not that I didn't think about it before the pandemic, because there's a lot of examples of people who've done extremely well in acting, you know, actors who've done extremely well without ever studying it or going to school for it. Same with directors, same with producers, same with writers. Exactly. So I guess what I would have to say is that school does sort of instill a a sense of discipline in you. Uh, School does sort of, you know, instill a sense of deadline, a sense of, you know, you know, getting things done, um, taking direction, learning those basics. One thing that that I do wish that I had that had been more important in my my training was the sense of uh, setting goals. You know, not just as an actor, but I mean, in terms of as a as a person, as a life, setting you know life goals. That that was just something we never really discussed. And I I understand that a lot of other programs around the country really instilled that in their students. So I think in in those sense, in that sense, it's it's important to sort of be in school for those reasons. But I, I don't know. I mean, if this is something you, you want to do and should and can do, you should go out and do it. As opposed to going to school, or is school important? As opposed to, to going to school, as opposed to spending a lot of time. School does have advantages, though, and oh, absolutely, and that you do I, get that discipline. I also think you mature, you grow up a little bit. Absolutely. All those Absolutely. And it's important in our society. You know, I used to tell my students, it's important to get a degree uh, only in the sense that it shows a prospective employer that you've accomplished something on Mm -hmm. your own. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's like we're mandated by law to go through high school. I mean, that's you have to do that, but you don't have to go to college. And and, employers, I think, you know, I've been told that they want they want degrees to, to show that you actually accomplish something on your own without anyone telling you you had to do it. Um, and that's that's very lucrative to an employer. Well, it seems to me that uh, even if you go into the beginning of your career thinking, I'm never going to teach, it's a good idea to have the undergraduate degree to eventually get the graduate degree to teach right. if you're ever going to do that. <laughs> right. That's true. So, that's very true. So there is there is a process to that, too. So I've been having the most marvelous conversation with uh, John Shepard, and we're going to wind this thing down a little bit. And John, I'm just wondering, in all of your experience in the entertainment industry, I, I'm assuming that you have had an experience or, or two that's either weird, quirky, offbeat, strange, or maybe just plain funny. Is there one or more of those that you can share with us? Oh, my gosh, there's so many. But I think one of the one of the what pops into my head is a. Uh, a story from when I was in college, actually, and it's 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 kind of funny, but it's a it's a it's sort of a a classic sort of. It was an opening night. I I played the gentleman caller in the Glass Menagerie. You okay, know the, and the gentleman caller is the only guy that's not the only person, the only character in the play that is not on stage during the first half of it, the first two thirds of it. Um, so I was back in the dressing room by myself, and um, in those days I smoked. I was a you know college kid and I smoked, so. There's a scene when the gentleman, the reason I say I smoke is because I, I had a book of matches and uh, I'd smoke backstage. And uh, those matches come into play in the, in, in the, uh, in the performance where uh, he comes to dinner and Laura, who, you know, freaks, freaks out and goes and lays down because she's all of a sudden she's sick. And uh, so the, the, they're the Amanda and Tom and the gentleman call her at dinner and uh, all of a sudden the lights go out. And because Tom hasn't pl- hasn't paid the uh, the electric bill, and so uh, uh, you know, and they've got a, ta- a candle opera on the on the table, and Amanda's like, you know, she says says something like, "Do you have a light? You know, do you have?" And and I had you know matches that I had backstage, and I I reached into my pocket. I would reach into my pocket as soon as the lights went out, and uh, to get them ready so that there wasn't a lot of lull be- be- between you know, do you have a light? And yes. Um, because there was maybe a half page of dialogue before he said, well, I can light the candle opera. So she comes to the point where she says, well, Mr. O'Connor, do you have a light? And I'd reached into my pocket and I had left my matches backstage <laughs> in the dressing room after smoking. And I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, the actors were like, you know, you know, those. and I said, you know what? I'll go back in the kitchen and, and see if I can find some matches. <laughs> And okay, so in the play, and I did, and, and fortunately, a prop person was listening and had matches there ready. And I came back on stage and lit the thing. And then in the play, in the moment later, he says, I'll go take a look at the fuse box to see if some fuses are out. And he goes back there 
and, and, a, and a kitchen he's never been in before. And he trips over something and she has a line where it says, I hope we don't lose him, blah, blah, blah. And I, all of a sudden in my head, I'm thinking, oh my God, here I am in this foreign kitchen. I've never, I've never been in before. And I can go back there and find a book of matches, but I can't find the fuse. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay so later that same performance i was so i was so rattled later that same performance uh there's a sequence where jim the gentleman caller is dancing with laura and uh he has seen her glass collection and there's a little unicorn standing on this table uh that was her prize piece and there's a moment in the play where, where they're dancing and they accidentally bump into the table and knocks off this unicorn and the unicorn the horn breaks and we had worked it out so that that we you know was a part of the dance and and if if it fell and then she if it hadn't broken she would she had she could mask it and break it uh so so the same performance i'm so rattled by the matches and all that stuff the same performance we're dancing and i swing her around and we missed the table <laughs> <laughs> he completely missed the table and and i look at her and i you know by this time i'm like i said let's try it again and i <laughs> literally threw her into the table and it was like the audience was thinking who is this madman you know throwing this poor crippled girl around who is around without his matches anyway this steve there's been countless others um in my in my career that not as bad as that but it's live theater it's live theater. Anything can happen. I think, I think, you know, there's a, there's a, a sense of, there's an ethos about audiences coming to see screw ups. It's called, sort of like, you know, watching a fight, you know, like who's going to get hurt or a car race or something. Who's going to crash. Uh, I think sometimes audiences come to see what's going to happen. Is there somebody going to screw up or miss an entrance? And a perfect example of why you need to be able to improvise. Exactly. Let's try it again, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> and you throw her into the table. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. All right. So last question for you today, John, um, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip beyond the wonderful advice and tips you've already given us that you like to give to students or someone starting out in the business, or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to the next level? Well, you know, one of the things I used to tell my students and I was, you know, quite honest about it was that, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying to teach you what I did wrong, you know? And uh, one of the things that I, I think uh, young actors need to know is that they need to uh, try not to encumber themselves with too much responsibility if they're going to go into this business. Um, they should set goals in terms of how long can I go, you know, if X, Y, and Z doesn't happen. And before they, they you know, get really super involved in responsibility. So I think that's one piece of advice. I think as I taught, one of the things that, you know, certainly when I was young, we, I was trained with the idea that I could do anything, that I could play any part that I could. And that's just wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. I think that people have to real, know their strengths and weaknesses. But more importantly, it's all about know yourself. You know, who are you? And it's a tough question for an actor because, you know, um, there's a famous short story that Kurt Vonnegut wrote near, years ago. They made it into a, actually a movie and uh, it's called Who Am I This Time? Where this guy who worked in a hardware store who had basically no personality was was like the town, the great the great actor of this town. He would do the community theater and he'd become Stanley Kowalski. He'd become these, and he was brilliant. He was brilliant. But 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 basically, in you know, when he was off stage, he was just sort of nothing. He was a bland kind of guy who worked at a hardware store. And I think it's really important that actors have a really strong sense of themselves and how they come across and to be true to that. And I think I've said, even in this discussion I've had with you, that, you know, when you when you approach a, a role, I, I look at, see where the compatibility is with myself. And I, I think that's super important that you find a way to link it with who you are, because that's ultimately what's going to attract you to, to people to cast you uh, is, is who you are, the uniqueness of, of who you are as compared to like you trying to be someone else or you trying to fit into a mold that, that you don't fit into. I think a, a, an acute, a, an acute sense of who you are is really important. Well, I and think that's such wonderful advice because uh, you, you can't be what you can't be. Right. And you can be everything and more of what you are. Exactly. That's a that's very well put, Steve. <laughs> you should be teaching acting. No, one of the one of these days. 
I'll, I'll wind up using that line when I teach my next class. <laughs> John Shepard, this has been so much fun for me, and I'm so grateful to you for spending time with me on StoryBeat today. And I know that uh, uh, the listeners are going to have a bunch of great advice to take away from today. That's great. It's been a, such a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And so we've come to the end of today's StoryBeat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.